Hi, so my name is Will Williams. I'm, uh, I'm majoring uh, in anthropology from Montclair State uh, this fall I'm in my senior year, uh, and I'm minoring in archaeology and uh, classical studies. Uh, so this, this presentation is part of a, a broader study uh, exploring the historical relationship between illness and capitalization in the 19th century. Uh, this study it was created in the summer of 2020 in conjunction with the Landmarks and Preservation Commission. We'll be looking at 19th century tuberculosis treatments from the Edwardian um, and Victorian understandings of health and the commodification of disease. We'll, be, uh, we'll examine how they perceived diseases were transmitted and what actions were taken by 19th century physicians to treat tuberculosis. This understanding of health, it will be contrasted by uh, an impression of the creators of proprietary medicines that explores the impetus to manufacture and market remedies understood today to be ineffectual. Now, to illustrate this relationship, I'll be discussing a sampling of three medicine bottles that were recovered in the 1990s to 1992 excavations at Van Cortlandt House. Uh, the, the health and mortality impact of tuberculosis throughout human history, uh, relative to other diseases, has left indelible markers on human culture. Um, the, the earliest written record of tuberculosis has been found in ancient India over 3,000 years ago. Uh, given this, this lengthy relationship, tuberculosis has ingrained itself as part of our culture. The, the human cost in New York City in the mid-1800s was significant. Uh, tuberculosis, or consumption, as it was then called, uh, claimed 425 lives per 100,000. Science at the time, it had few remedies to treat consumption. Uh, popular culture romanticized suffering through cultural outlets such as poetry, opera, and more sinisterly through personal presentation. Uh, it, became, it became fashionable to adopt a, a consumptive look. And uh, Alexandra Dumas Fils, he's quoted as saying, it was, uh, it was fashion to, to suffer from the lungs. Everybody was consumptive, poets especially. It was good form to spit blood after any emotion that was at all sensational and to die before reaching the age of 30. Uh, thinness, frailty, and the sunken mortal eyes became uh, symbolic of, of feminine beauty. The opportunities for profit presented by society's desperation and the need for treatment that were exploited by unscrupulous parties. Harmful panaceas distributed in the acts of capitalism, they flooded an unregulated environment. And the druggists, they, they leveraged the political and the cultural environment of self-determination and individual prosperity. So the, the American dream, it promised, in the, it promised the individuals the capacity to reinvent themselves as experts, uh, professionals, or physicians and chemists. As part of a collection of 60 medicine bottles, the, the artifacts being introduced, they were recovered from the Van Cortland site between 1919 and 1992, throughout three summers. The, the deposition location of these three bottles has been identified as the old barn. Uh, in their analysis of the dig, the excavators concluded the internment pit where the bottles were recovered was a fill site, and the contents of the pit were uh, deposited either one or more quick succession fill events. The, the, the primary work of Dr. Samuel Sheldon Fitch of 707 and later 714 Broadway, New York, uh, it's centered around tuberculosis. Um, he was a prolific writer on the subject, authoring a number of books regarding the treatment of consumption, uh, his theories on the purpose and operation of the lungs, uh, and theories on the causes of consumption. So given Fitch's predilection towards the consumptive subject, um, it's reasonable to assume that this bottle contained his cherry pulmonic, and the, the active ingredient in cherry pulmonic, cherry bark, was understood to be an appetite stimulant that um, strengthened digestion. Uh, this bottle, it bears the embossment of Hegman and Co uh, on the front panel and chemists on the right panel and New York, um, New, chemists on the left, sorry, and New York on the right panel. The, the embossment and description of the, the bottles of uh, 10, uh, the dimensions of 10 and a quarter inches by three inches was documented by Richard Fike uh, and it matched the bottle recovered at the Van Cortland site. And in Fike's description, he identifies this bottle as containing a cod liver oil. A, a common 19th century treatment for tuberculosis. I like the cherry pulmonics, the cod liver oil was considered an appetite stimulant and aided in digestion. The, the physicians at Styles and Mayich, they, they ascribed the bile and the oil to its usefulness as a treatment in his almanacs, uh, written to market and support his line of products. And JCA also suggests taking cod liver oil in a supportive role to his cherry pectoral. 
Ayer's Cherry Pictorial uh, was produced from 1843 to 1920. Um, and production that far into the 20th, 20th century, it could be ascribed to Ayer's support and adoption for an ingredient list on the bottle's labels um, that was mandated in the 1906 clampdown on proprietary medicines. Of the, the six different bottles produced, uh, six different versions that were produced, this version has been identified as belonging to the period between 1870 and 1880. Uh, though Ayer's literature and his intensive marketing, through his, through his literature and intensive marketing campaigns, we can understand uh, that his efforts, they best elucidate the idea of a medical and health environment that was intense on maximizing profits by any means necessary. Ayer's advertising campaigns uh, utilized images of the young and the vulnerable to sell his products. They were tapping into society's fear of tuberculosis. The, the timing and release of Ayer's Ayer & Co's 1877 almanac it underlines the era's understanding of disease transmission. Uh, in the author's writing, it uh, describes tuberculosis as the product of an unresolved, uh, unresolved cough. And I quote, we would warn our readers to seek surely the best and surest relief uh, they, they can find uh, for coughs and colds that settle on the lungs, do not allow them to become chronic. A cough neglected becomes chronic and leads to the formation of tubercles in the lungs. Uh, it was just five years later that Robert Koch uh, identifies bacteria as the, the cause of tuberculosis. Van Cortland House uh, is a mid 18th century manor house situated in what is now Van Cortland Park. Um, described as a plantation, the farm relied on the labor of enslaved peoples until the early 19th century. Their last private owner, Augustus Bibby, changed his name to Van Cortland as part of a condition of inheritance um, set by his uncle, who passed in 1839. Uh, Bibby married uh, Charlotte Amelia Bailey Bunch in, the, in 1852, uh, with whom they had six children. The, the house and land that was sold to the city of New York in 1889 to become a public space. Collectively, the three bottles in this, of the study and the contents, they span between 17 and 33 years and occupying three decades of the 19th century. Uh, Pre-antibiotic sanitarium statistics, they, they will show that those who were um, home treated before, they were, before institutionalization and were sputum positive, they had an 81% 81, uh, 81 fatality rate. Data also shows that in cases of death, uh, it typically occurred within the first 10 years. So of all the, all the family, aside from uh, Charlotte Van Cortlands, they all survived into the 20th century. And given that the remedies of the study are home treatments and the, the long lifespans of the family, it's, it's reasonably safe to speculate that they're excluded from being the owners of up to 30 years of tuberculosis treatment. Um, many remedies were also marketed as cold and cough cures. But however, if we refer to as literature, um, we understand that in his opinion, colds and coughs, they were a precursor to more serious ailments uh, like tuberculosis. The hypothesized location, uh, locations within the house where these and 57 other bottles originated include a bathroom or dressing room, a dining room, china closet, and the bottle storage room. Uh, it would seem unlikely that at least two to three bottles would remain in the bathroom for at least 10 or more years. Um, the most likely bottle, bottle source on the property is the bottle storage room. Uh, given these combined factors, um, who, were the, who were the people who were most likely that were the owners and the consumers of these remedies? Uh, this study speculates that the consumers of the medicines were the farm laborers. If this is the case, the evidence highlights wider, uh, wider 19th century socio-cultural disparities as outsiders in the 21st century, looking back at the impact of tuberculosis, we see the disease's manifestation in fashion, literature, and opera. Uh, these aspects of culture, they're all synonymous with wealth and status. Consuming books and poetry implies a level of education, something that was limited to mostly wealthier classes. Uh, and re replicating the symptoms of disease through cultural content is a behavior enabled by disposable time and income. Um, tuberculosis predominantly impacted the poorer working class neighborhoods, um, the same people who would not have had access to the palliative care, a more effective treatment than the nostrums that were produced by the likes of air. Um, it's easy, it's easy as technology envelops residents in the 21st century to look back at these, these seemingly quaint and sometimes dangerous ideas about medicine. Uh, society in the 19th century was at a crossroads. Uh, health and the body was in part informed by theories originating in the classical period. 
These ideas were meeting head on with the side effects of industrialization, the overcrowding of cities and the expansion and experimentation of chemistry. Added to these conditions, the, the driving force to get many of these products onto the marketplace was the influence of capitalism. So history, it has a habit of repeating itself. Uh, in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, the nostrums and free market motivated quacks, they have returned. Um, in a July 27, 2020 NPR report uh, that exposed 40, 46 products that were listed on a public internet marketplace that uh, claimed efficacy against fighting COVID-19. And political, uh, political endorsement of ineffectual drugs, it also has precedent in America's political history. Trade cards featuring the then newly elected president, Grover Cleveland, they, they appeared touting Wood Sarsaparilla's uh, blood cleansing qualities. The relationship between money and power, it's, it's reciprocal and reoccurring. The, the distinction between endorsing a product for profit or political currency, it, it easily falls into semantics. To, to fully comprehend the motivations of 19th century proprietary medicine manufacturers, um, their actions, they should be carefully interpreted by looking at the temporal and cultural, culturally relative intersection that they're occupying. Uh, in doing so, we might realize that our society's public health and the cultural experiences um, that we share similarities with our Victorian predecessors. However, there's a crucial distinction when analyzing our culture in situ against our ancestors. Uh, citizens of, of the 19th century, they were operating within the confines of their inherited and their emerging scientific knowledge. Whereas we, on the other hand, we are less hobbled by these circumstances. Um, and what remains then is only our society's desire for wealth and for profit.